diary it is the end of november 2023 and we've come into the to the exciting point which is part two of my video of uh, upgrading the 2011 imac now this is uh, not a detailed procedure it's kind of a high level overview procedure you'll have to do a little bit of work yourself uh, if you have such a machine and uh, so i'm just putting the heating on it's freezing in the cave here um, You'll have to do a little bit of work yourself to actually make it happen. But I'll go through the broader steps and you should, at the end of the day, have a lovely iMac from 2011 running Ventura, which is a reasonably useful and workable system. So the first thing I want to tell you is that we're in 2023 and uh, I did an export of a video yesterday on an Apple Silicon machine and uh, the 15 minute video came to uh, about 17 gigabytes in size and that kind of video is not going to be able to be processed on this machine, on this iMac. This is a 11 or 12 year old machine and it's going to be useful for basic tasks, it's not going to be useful for any kind of heavy CPU load and, does, uh, and also the fact that I, iMovie doesn't work on this, on this Apple, so it definitely won't be useful. So bear that in mind, you've got an 11-year-old machine. Now, I came across this machine as, as a gift. Uh, the machine wasn't working properly. It would start, and then it would just switch off halfway through the boot process. So the initial machine state was, it, this is an A311. It's an EMC2389 machine. So Apple has these, these numbers, which you can look up on the interweb. And from that, you can exactly see what the specs of your machine are, that together with the serial number. Uh, the situation would be that this machine would start and then it would just switch itself off. I wouldn't even finish the boot process. So eventually uh, I made a High Sierra boot USB key and that was done from a, an Intel Mac. So again, this process, if you've only got, let's say, a Windows computer and you don't have access to another Apple Intel computer, you're a bit screwed. Um, I do have access to another, oh, a very old uh, Apple Intel machine. Uh, no gift, thank you very much. And uh, so I was able to make a USB key, a Type A USB key, which would fit into the back of this system uh, and able to boot from that. And using that, I was able to do a disk check of the SATA drive inside this machine and found that the SATA drive had some errors with which it couldn't be fixed. So that's the reason it wasn't booting. And during that process of trying to fix it, the screen stayed on for at least 30 minutes, probably because I'm so slow at doing this. Uh, so it was clear to me that the screen and the powering off wasn't due, uh, it was probably due to a disk error and not an electronics error. I thought it was worth proceeding. Uh, I'd also point out that with these old Macs, uh, 2011 and so forth Macs, uh, Apple hadn't quite made them totally unserviceable by normal people and by what by that I mean to say that Apple has been on a, a crusade I would say to make their computers unserviceable they've removed it, removed any kind of socketed component which means to say that if for example you have a hard disk problem on an Apple silicon machine you can't actually get the hard drive out and put the hard drive into another machine and on some machines where it is socketed with Apple Silicon, for example, on Apple Studios, there have been tests that whereby people have taken out that hard drive and put it into another machine, and it's keyed to the original machine, so it still won't actually boot. So Apple has done their level best to make sure that when your machine goes wrong, you've got to take it to an Apple service centre, uh, or, or you just can't do anything yourself, pretty much. But on 2011 Apple iMac, there is a lovely little hatch here. And in that little hatch, you can install a memory upgrade. So that's a good thing to know, which is that 2011 iMacs or thereabouts, you could do still memory upgrades. And for MacBooks of around that kind of era, certainly before, let's say, 2015, you could upgrade the memory and the disk. But, you know, today it's all soldered on. It's all done on purpose. It makes it fractionally thinner. But it, as an engineer, if I had to make a, an engineering choice as to whether this machine would be serviceable, uh, 
provide ba with basic technical skills or not, uh, I would choose to make stuff socketed. At least the PCIe cards, the memory and the disk, just like many of the manufacturers in the uh, Windows world. Uh, but again, they're, they're, they're starting to follow Apple's lead and making stuff less serviceable. It's a, just a, a shameful situation. I don't think any engineer worth their salt would would uh, would agree with this pr 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 you know, practice. And I, I wonder what Apple engineers think. Anyway, that's uh, my <laughs> rant finished. Uh, on the back, we've got users at ports. We've got um, not just... Uh, uh, we've got a we've got a firewire port. We've got an ex a screen port, and we've got the usual USB ports. Now, initially, uh, I was using a, a USB connected keyboard because I couldn't quite figure out uh, whether on when I started up the, the iMac because it didn't come with a keyboard uh, as to uh, how I would actually get the Bluetooth connection. So I'd recommend also starting up with a 2.4 gigahertz a keyboard. Uh, and not if you're if you're in a similar situation. Okay, so the next thing to note was uh, network installation. So yes, when you start the machine up, potentially you should be able to reinstall the machine from a network server at Apple. And indeed, I connected the Ethernet. Uh, well, I thought that would be quicker to my local router, uh, and. Uh, I thought, great, I'll be able to reinstall High Sierra, which is the latest supported operating system for this 2011 system. And guess what? It just doesn't work. I presume Apple have switched off their servers or, again, disabled the uh, servers. It's a bit naughty, really, because if you had a 2011 machine, then uh, you're, you're basically a little bit screwed unless you've got some extra technical knowledge and perhaps another Apple system. So eventually I made a USB key with High Sierra on it. If something to be a 64 key with the Type A, uh, it was a SanDisk key, I used a lot of them, and uh, I couldn't make it on an Apple Silicon machine, I had to make it on an Intel Mac. Um, another thing to know was, that, as I think I say later, I couldn't, despite trying several times, sorry, I'm just trying to get hot, it's freezing in this case, I couldn't seem to uh, make a DVD that would work. I've got this. Is, this system's got a DVD in this side here. That's my hand. <laughs> my hand. There, 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 on the right hand side of the screen. So there's a, a, a DVD slot, uh, and since the High Sierra or Ventura was over 4.7 gigs, I had to use a dual layer DVD, and I uh, just couldn't. I mean, I could read the DVD that I'd created on an Apple Silicon machine. I just couldn't get it to boot from that DVD. So it was back to USB key, in fact, which worked best. Um, so we're at the point now, the machine wouldn't start. I now have a USB key with High Sierra on it. I can now boot from that High, high, uh, high Sierra key. And uh, eventually I was able to, oh, I'm skipping ahead now. So, so originally I, I found out I had a, I could get to the uh, High Sierra system and let's rewind. Sorry, initially the machine was switching off. I made a USB key and managed to install High Sierra operating system onto this, onto the, onto what I thought was a faulty hard drive. It clearly wasn't a faulty hard drive. It was just a hard drive which had so many uh, FSCK errors that it couldn't boot. So. The actual drive I had was not the spinning drive was not actually faulty. So the next thing I thought I'd do was because I didn't trust the hard drive was to upgrade the hard disk. Now this is possible on this 2011 Mac again. It's an A1311 Mac. All the videos I had seen told me to take this front screen off and dismantle some cables and take the hard drive out, put the new hard drive in. I did not do that because. Uh, when I opened up the system, it was full of dust and the cables looked so brittle that I thought if I'd managed to get them off, but they, first of all, they wouldn't come off, didn't seem to want to come off. And I thought if I managed to get them off, I'd either break the cables or wouldn't be able to get them back on in a satisfactory fashion. So the good news is, with certainly with two people, I managed it with one person, but certainly with two people, it's possible to dismantle the machine and install 
an SSD drive without taking off the cables and you do it in the following way you need to buy I think I've got a little list of things I did in the right order Where are, where's my list so I bought some suction cups uh, I fix it suction cups from Amazon I bought a one terabyte uh, MX500 drive and a two and a half to three and a half inch disc bracket now the one terabyte crucial MX500 SSD uh, I sort of did it on purpose because on my current Apple Silicon system uh, I couldn't afford to buy a one terabyte hard drive so I thought just just to, to, to annoy myself and to annoy Apple I'd be able to fit a one terabyte SSD into this 11 year old system and it just goes to show you what Apple's uh, practices are all about um, they charge you an arm and a leg for memory and um, hard drive upgrades and I just couldn't afford it on an Apple Silicon system but on this old system for £70 I managed to get a one terabyte 560 megabytes per second SSD and that's the difference it, it makes if you've got upgradable components in a system anyway using those two suction cups you attach them to the front of the screen without doing any screws and then you lift off the, this glass front screen Made sure to wear some nitrile gloves because I didn't want to touch the actual under screen and get it all fingerprinted. Then there's some screws on the left and some screws on the right. Once those uh, eight screws are removed, the screen is now loose and maybe just physically pivoted forward. There was no glue at all, unlike a modern Apple system. And the screw is actually, the screen is actually loose. So this would be a good time to have uh, your friend to arrive to hold the screen. You're going to lift the screen forward, and whilst that screen is lifted forward, with uh, I think it's a Phillips screwdriver, a short Phillips screwdriver, I undid the screws that held the, the uh, three and a half inch spinning drive. So I undid that three and a half inch drive. I previously installed the two and a half inch drive into the three and a half inch caddy, and then simply put the caddy back into. Uh, the uh, the hole that uh, was was uh, from the old drive and screwed it back. Now there are three connectors, uh, of which one you won't use, which is a fan a fan regulation connector. And what happens is when you start the iMac up in the future, it's going to be going on full fan speed. So you have to install a a fan control program to regulate that speed. And if you make that program auto start when you start the, the Mac in the future, then you know, the fans go on full. And as soon as you log in, the, fact, the auto start program kicks in and, and brings the fans down. Because on the Crucial SSD, there's no fan control. Okay, so put the uh, SSD in, uh, put the screen back. I did not, of course, put the screws back because never put the screws back until you've actually made sure you've done a correct job. That's just uh, engineering 101. Uh, at this point, I, I think I, I believe I just tried to boot uh, from the USB key just to make sure the machine was still you know, working, working. And it was. So then I switched it off, put the screws back, then put the glass screen back. So now we've got a 16 gigabyte iMac with an SSD and a USB key which uh, can install High Sierra. And I know um, this is a slow video, but you know that, that you're just gonna have to just gonna have to live with it. Uh, we're not going any faster. So the next thing to do is to install High Sierra using the USB key. Do it all over again onto the SSD this time, and that is your starting point for the upgrade. Now, after you've installed High Sierra, which takes quite a long time, even on the SSD. The next thing you need to do is to install Open Core Legacy Patcher, OCLP as it's called, in the trade. Uh, now, that once installed will kind of install itself, do a little bit of compilation, and it's able to download a newer version of macOS all by itself and do lots of patching and some, lots of clever stuff. Okay. So, you need to look at the GitHub for Open Core Legacy Patcher. It's not rocket science, it'll, take, it'll walk you through what it needs to do. Is the web page for that getting started, etc., etc., etc. So it's a, it's a very friendly web page. Just follow it through. So download and build macOS installer, reboot. Okay, so 
We've now got to the point where we've installed High Sierra, we've installed OCLP, we've actually made a new USB key and we've put a new operating system onto it. Now, take it from me, Sonoma doesn't work, you can give it a try, but in doing the trying, I wiped my original system out and had to start all over again. So a much a quicker solution would be not to bother with Sonoma and just go for Ventura, which is a one-year-old OS. But the whole reason you're doing this is that if you, on High Sierra, you do not have a working Apple App Store. Whereas with Ventura, you have a working Apple App Store. So you need to install Ventura. So you make the, you make the USB key for uh, Ventura and then you simply upgrade to Ventura. So you have to boot, once Open Core Legacy Patcher is installed, you boot. So Open Core Legacy Patcher installs itself as an EFI bootloader. And from that bootloader, it will give you the option, once that USB key is plugged in, to either boot from the SSD, which would, in this case, go back to High Sierra, because you haven't done anything else yet, or you can boot uh, Ventura. Okay. So you're not, you have to go through, don't forget, you must go through the OCLP uh, EFI loader. Don't press the, uh, the option key or, or the command key, I forget which one it is, to boot directly from that key because it will not work. You need to boot into Open Core and from Open Core you do the upgrade. Okay, and that basically is it. So, uh, yeah, it took a long time, but we were there. Now, and as from the first video, you'll notice that we do have a pretty usable uh, Ventura system. Not everything works, everything that uses the Metal Graphics programming interface, so Apple Maps. Uh, or Find My, for example, does not work, but many things do work. All browsers work, YouTube works, <laughs> and that's about nine tenths of it, isn't it? Uh, that's what the kids would say. All right, Daryl, that's it. So we've got a working uh, Ventura 2011 iMac. Things are well in this world. Uh, I wish you all the success and repeat what I have done here. Thanks very much for watching.